Okay, so um, everybody knows I'm Hillary Topper, and this is We Are Endurance Athletes webinar series. Um, and um, welcome everyone. And I want to thank and welcome Carlin Pipes, uh, who is the world's fastest master swimmer. <laughs> and I would love, Carlin, for you to just start off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got there and how fast you really are. How fast I really am. Oh, but you know what? <laughs> Okay, so first of all, I'll give you guys some background information. Hillary and I met when you came to one of the workshops that I set up by the Ultimate Energizer Bunny, Barb Cronin Stagnari. And then I had just recently launched a, my memoir called The Do-Over, and um, Hillary was my agent. And uh, we got a lot of podcasts and a lot of exposure in some magazines. But as you know, self-published books are not easy to get out there. So um, the book's still around. And uh, there we go. It's about the do-over. <laughs> oh, wait, here we go. Here's my husband. He can chime in here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Hillary you've ever seen this. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good morning. So I, Christopher's from Canada. I had to import. We, we don't have very good <laughs> marriage prospects here on the big island. <laughs> it's a pretty small island. So I imported from Canada. Um, so, so let me get into the swimming experience. Um, you know what, Hillary, I'd like for you to, to wrap that one up because you did a good job of, of um, you know my story, you know. Well, I, yeah, I do, but no, we want to hear from you. Um, just, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, the last time that you competed um, in the Masters Swimming and how you did. Oh, okay. All right. So, well, you got to have a little bit of background. So I swam when I was an age group swimmer, uh, quite successful as an age group swimmer. I um, was coached by a uh, two-time Olympic gold medalist, Mike Troy, who had won a gold medal in the 60 Olympics in the tuna butterfly. So I swam in a very, very competitive team, um, which really helped me excel because when you're swimming or training with people that are better than you, you just naturally, you know, if you're at all competitive, you want to be with the first people, right? And it doesn't matter if they're older than you or younger than you or a, a boy or a girl. It's kind of like, you know, you just want to get your, your hand on the wall first. And so I, I grew up swimming. I was talented. Uh, I worked hard. But a, a big part of what motivated me to swim was the rewards. <laughs> like... <laughs> like a trip, like to go someplace, or it wasn't really the medals or the time so much. It was kind of more like uh, my mom would bait me, like, if you break this record, you can get a, a tenant, pair of tennis shorts or ski glasses. Those are the things that were hot in the 70s. Anyway, long story short, I, I excelled. And by the age of 15, I was invited to go to the first ever Olympic training camp um, uh, training center. Uh, in the Colorado Springs. Uh, sadly, at that same juncture in my life, I also had my very first alcoholic drink. And as soon as I felt that buzz and that release from the alcohol, I wanted out of the pool and into the bottle. And it was just like that. And so then became the struggle with this highly, uh, a girl with a lot of potential, um, love swimming, but found that the pressure and the, the, the competition was just too much. So that became my downward spiral, which uh, culminated with age 31 and entering a rehab with a blood alcohol five and a half times the legal limit and nearly dead. Um, so that's the prelude to me getting back in the water. And when I got back in the water, what was interesting is um, I had to make peace with it. You know, water is, it's, water is not just swimming, it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I had distorted my relationship with the water so much that I had kind of blamed it for my problems. And when I realized my, the water wasn't the problem, I was the problem, I really had to make peace with the water and kind of apologize. And once I did that, I got back in and started swimming. And lo and behold, it wasn't long before I was faster than I was when I was 15. And, um, the rest they say is kind of aquatic history. I've set over 230 masters world records to date. 
um, five still stand that are in the 35 to 39 age group. So they're 24 years old. They're the oldest records on the book still. And it's, it's kind of neat because I look back at, at the time when I was really, really in focus and training and, and Brad, probably you kind of, you probably re really relate to this. You've been in the sport for a long time, right? Sometimes you look back and you think about the things that you did and you go, God, how did I do that? But when you're in the moment and you're working towards that goal, it's just, you know, it's just putting one foot in front of the other. It's one stroke in front of the other. It's one more workout. It's another race. And it's a chance to keep testing yourself to see what you're made of. And so as far as how fast, my Ironman swim time is 51 um, without a wetsuit. And um, I was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 2015 which was really cool because I got to the privilege of joining Johnny Weissmuller, Mark Spitz, Janet Evans. I mean, the whole crowd of people that had succeeded in the sport of swimming or aquatics. But my story was a bit different. My, the route that I took there was a much more difficult route that almost killed me. And that's why I think that I appreciate the water so much. Um, I also came to um, this awareness because my my dad was the alcoholic in the family. And I always thought that the only thing that my dad gave me was his dimples, his blue eyes, and the gene for alcoholism. But what his greatest gift to me was he was a brilliant musician and an exceptional teacher. And that's where I found my true passion. Racing, that fleeting moment of winning or reaching that goal is great. But in the last two days, I've actually taught two people how to swim. And, and it's basic, simple stuff. But one is a 22 year old bot boy that lives in Hawaii and he can't get a girlfriend because he can't go to the beach because he's too embarrassed to tell anybody that he can't swim. And he plops down $250 to get a swimming lesson. And I'm like, you are really serious about wanting to learn. And he was so nervous. But by the end, I had him doing laps in my endless pool and his you know, he was like a little kid grinning from, he goes, I can do this. I said, yeah, but you've got a learner's permit. You, if you're going to swim right now, you got to swim wherever you can touch. And then like yesterday was an Indian guy that is 65, basically the same thing, letting go of fear of the water and learning how to work with the water and that relationship to, to do something that really is untethers you from the rest of the world. When we're in the water, we float free. We're untethered. And it's a, it's a beautiful gift. And so all things aside, I would say, what I'm, am I most proud of my swimming accomplishments or am I um, most content with the ability to share that gift with others? I would say that that was my, that's my focus point is helping others. Awesome. And I want you to help us today. But okay. before we start with that, I do want to get back to the point where you said that you have this relationship with the water, because there are a lot of people I know, a lot of triathletes who are absolutely afraid of the water, especially the open water. Right. What kind of tips would you give to those people? To oh, <laughs> this is, this is a great one. Okay. I can work with a person and within the first couple of moments of them entering the water. And you remember, I'm, I'm doing my, um, my lessons in an endless pool at my house. They, the way they enter the water, you can see tension building up and tightness. And that is something that I believe often comes from a traumatic water experience in their past. And I think really no amount of self-convincing can really release those buried subconscious feelings and thoughts about the water that were laid down quite a long time ago. So a lot of times when I, when I ask people, well, here's a great example, Ellen Hart. She is in her 60s now and she won Ironman a couple of years ago. Um, her debut Ironman, she got second. She is, she's actually an amazing woman. Um, she was uh, featured in an ABC movie a long time ago, Dying to be Perfect. So she had an eating disorder and she was Olympic trial qualifier and running and, and something else. Anyway, I'm now an elite triathlete. And as soon as she gets in the water, I go, you know, Ellen, how, how do you feel about the water? She goes, oh, I hate it. 
<laughs> and and I could see it in her her how she moved. So the long story short is people have water traumas. Some that they remember right away can tell you exactly when, some that it's buried in their subconscious. And what I recommend is going and getting some therapy because this is not going to go away. It will be triggered in stressful situations and come right to the surface. Uh, and if you can't remember something, I would recommend you talk to a parent, a sibling, um, and see if there was anything going on that you don't remember. Uh, secondly, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a your own personal experience. It could be your familial um, message about water. Uh, I have a client of mine who grew up on the Rio Grande. He didn't take a swimming lesson until he was 40. But you know what he did before he could swim? He signed up for Ironman Lake Placid. So I got him to, by the time he came out and did two camps in Kona, the first time he got to the halfway um, which is, you know, 1.2 miles. And the second time he came out, he made it to the Ironman Man and he did it. But his message in his family growing up, because they were right on the border of the Rio Grande, was don't go in the water. It's the devil. It'll kill you. So that's, it, it can be so many different things. It could be, you know, girls don't swim. Uh, it can be a lot, a lot of different things. Um, but one last story on this, and this is how sneaky it can be. I was working with a girl who is a therapist and um, we started doing a trade. And I said, you know, Janelle, I just get this feeling. You just have, you always feel like you have to move. And when I say why this is hard is when we're in panic mode, what do you start doing more? You breathe often and you kick harder. And you do those two things and you are out of breath and gassed. So there's a physical reaction as you panic through your swim. And it can be triggered by a group of people. Anyway, I said, Janelle, um, I, I just think that you've had something. She goes, nope, nope, nope. I've done a lot of work. Not Came back a couple of weeks later. She goes, Carlin, I remembered my water trauma. And I said, what? She goes, I was floating down a river with a girlfriend. I was 12 years old. The inner tube flipped. We were trapped under a tree. I couldn't get up. And I went, oh, there we go. <laughs> and so here is somebody who's a therapist who had buried this. And then her mom, she said that she came home from her, her little outing with her girlfriend and her mom said, how'd, how'd the day go? And she said, oh, I almost drowned. I'm going to my room. <laughs> so she unlocked that. So my favorite saying when it comes to water trauma and your experiences, whether by a thread or a chain, a bird cannot fly. And it's worth it to invest in some uh, EMDR, eye movement rapid desensitization for uh, post-traumatic stress, maybe one session. And you will be amazed at how freeing that can be. So let me ask you, Carlin. So when you teach adults who are already swimmers, right? When you teach swimming, you do it in a different way. You don't do it the traditional way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, I have kind of developed these methods that, that for me, I, being in Kona, a lot of times people come out on vacation and they'll get one lesson or maybe two. So I realized that I might only see this person for a very brief period of time. And I wanna give them as much information as possible because I give you the tools to go home and practice. Um, and it's not like a whole bunch of drills. I don't teach swimming, I teach self-awareness. So there are five components to the self-awareness. First of all, currently, what are you doing? Okay, why are you doing it? What could you do differently? Why would you wanna do it differently? And the fifth and most important one is, how do you do it differently? All right. So I don't really even need to see what your stroke is currently. We just basically start from a clean slate. We floated face down with our arms outstretched in a position like this. We learned to relax and let the water float, float your body, keep your legs together. And after we turned everything off, we simply just started paddling your body like a surfboard. And when you do that, what, you ha what happens is you just scoot down the pool, throw in a breath here and there, but even that's something that can be added later. The whole point is you wanna get people on the surface and moving forward and feeling successful. It's not about getting skinny. It's not about lifting the elbow. It's not even about kicking. It's just about getting comfortable, floating, staying near the surface so there's less drag and moving down the pool. 
and you basically start refining it from that but it's right there you, that's what i did with these two people that learned to swim i said they were doing laps in a seven meter pool you know just stroking like this not rotating not worrying about the kick and just moving it forward and if you really watch the elite swimmers that's pretty much what they're doing too it's not rocket science so that's that's the methodology is just basically break it down to the simplest measure and then start adding some more things. Um, things that get a little bit more confusing would be, well, how long do I let my hand go back? Well, if you think about it, if you're on a surfboard, you wouldn't finish your stroke. You would just scoop out in front. And the cool thing about freestyle, I like to use the, uh, to go over the coral reef is how you can get working on the catch, perceive something dangerous below you and so you float the elbow up as opposed to turning it up. So you wanna keep that down. But if you look at it, this is awfully lot like that, which is butterfly. So I'm pretty sneaky in the middle of my freestyle workshops, I will teach the entire pool how to some butterfly and they don't even know it. And I'll have the entire pool in less than a 25 successfully swimming butterfly. Yeah, so it's really cool. Yeah, it's and, and actually the butterfly really works great for the catch because you're gonna bend the elbows to do the two arms at one time and that serves you really well to set up the catch for freestyle. So, so you know, that's I've, it. I've actually been finding that Tarzan does that too. Tarzan is a fabulous drill. <laughs> um, and in not how, and it, okay. So, okay, anybody in the audience here um, Janine, why would Tarzan be an effective way to teach freestyle? If your head and body are out of the water, or not body, upper chest. Yep. You got yep. to do this, I mean, fast. And yep. have to like really dig at it. Because uh, <laughs> I've, yeah, I've done Tarzan. It's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. It's a really it good catch drill. It, 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 it is so good. I think out of all of the things, when I sit there and I'm getting somebody struggling, because you, my opinion is there are two places you want to stay away from in swimming. And it's exactly the same two places people tell you that you want to go. Stay away from coming into the center and stay away from the back. Both those two go together. If you finish your stroke in the back, it's going to make your hand go into the center because you're balancing right? If this hand's back, they're sticking here. So when we do head up water polo, what we're doing is we're making it very difficult to swim because your head's out of the water and you've upset the line of balance. So now what do we have to get? Efficient. We have to become more efficient because if we don't, we're going to drown. And honestly, this came from how ancient people swam. They probably swam with their head up if they had the aptitude to do a breaststroke instead of a crawl stroke, they would have done that, but not everybody can do that kick. That's an anatomical uh, advantage or disadvantage, so to speak. Um, so yeah, so head up water polo is the truth serum. That's the word, truth serum. Try S pulling with your head up, right? Try putting thumb down and start your pull. Try going straight arm, try finishing your stroke try rolling like a log, all these things. I, you, you try it like one way, try it another way and, and you compare and it just tells you, oh, whatever is the easiest way to survive doing Tarzan is going to be the most efficient with your head down. Now I know Janine, you had a question. Sure. It was earlier, I was just gonna say that I did take one of your classes in person. I thought you looked familiar, yeah. And. Uh, I still glide. I, I, I float on the water. You know, the first thing I do when I get in the pool is float. Well, I'll say going to float about halfway across the first lap every time. That's every so good. The surfboard body balance drill. I love that. Yeah. That's great. Now you get cold easy. I remember that. Are you there? I'm, I'm do you sorry. get cold? Do you get cold I, easy in the? Do I get cold easy in the pool? I, I start out very cold. 
Yeah. Okay. So that's another, um, sometimes we have to look for outside influences that uh, affect our swimming ability to be relaxed in the water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny people like I, our open water, or our pool is 71 or 72 right now. And as much as I could swim in the endless pool and I can swim in the ocean, nothing beats, you got to get the turns in. That's where you're getting a lot of core. So I just, I wear a thin wetsuit you know, because 71 is too cold for me. I, I always think that you, I mean, you got to do whatever you can to stay warm. So if you're dealing with a cool, like Eisenhower can be very cold. Oh, it's freezing. <laughs> yeah. So there's no harm in wearing a wetsuit. And I, I'm going to give a plug for Xterra right now. Xterra's got some thin, their Volt wetsuit is I think a one mil sleeveless. Mm -hmm. I cut it off at the knee. So it looks like a speed suit and they're 59 bucks right now. Uh, at Xterra Outlet. Um, so, so don't be ashamed to wear a wetsuit in your training, especially if you're going to be wearing one in a triathlon. It's no big deal. Stay warm. Colin, so you had mentioned that you shouldn't go all the way back, but yeah. shouldn't you go to your hip or no, that's too far? Okay. Great, great, great question. All right. I want everybody to pretend. Okay. Imagine you're watching a golf swing. Yeah. All right. So Brad, I'm going to direct this to you. So Brad, um, you're doing a golf swing. How much energy hits the ball? I think you're it's on mute. You're on <laughs> mute, Brad. <laughs> I think he's talking, but I don't hear him. I know. On mute. He's like, I, I'm I don't know. She, he's on mute. I don't. I'm not sure. All right, Nicole, who I can't see. Anybody, anybody golf in here? Ray golfs. Okay, where's Ray? It's down there. Okay, there, I'm there now. I'm back. Okay, Brad <laughs> Center. Okay, so tell not me. My fault. It wouldn't unmute. In a golf <laughs> swing, how much energy hits the ball? Um, well, certainly not all of it. Yeah, but it's a lot, right? Okay, so let's yeah. take it a golf I mean, you swing. Try and focus the whole swing so that it focuses on that one spot. Bingo, and then and then what do you do? You let it go, right? Well, you follow through. Yep, bingo. So that is, so maximum power for the least amount of time. That's what we're looking for in a power sport. Maximum power for the least amount of time. Because if, if Brad hits that ball and hacks it, he's going to pick up the ball and he's going to take it with the club and it stays together. And then it's way off over there, right? And by the way, the perfect golf swing, I've been told, I'm not a golfer, feels like nothing, right? It's almost like you didn't hit anything. Okay, good swimming feels like that. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what about the finish of the stroke? The hand still travels back to the thigh, but there's no pressure on it. And as a matter of fact, if you watch any of my videos, you'll see my thumb going to my thigh. But what you need to look at is, where's my elbow? It's in the air already. It's out of the picture. If you look at any good elite swimmer and you freeze them, you'll see their hand going back to their thigh, but their elbow's already in the recovery. You're in the follow through. And I also like a golf analogy too, because at the top part of the golf swing, you stop. And that's where the glide is in freestyle. You want to take a little mini break up at the front to create a balanced position to support your breath. So you're going to have your hand out in front slightly wider than your shoulders. And it doesn't have to be a long one. So I'm always saying quick in the back, long in the front, quick in the back, long in the front, quick in the back. And by the way, any of you that are really hate doing catch up drill, don't ever tap in the middle because we're trying to stay away from the center and we're trying to stay away from the back and shorten up the pull in the back. And I don't mean like a cat walking in water, you know, where you're yanking your arms out at your armpit. I'm just saying, decrease the length of your po the power phase. So it's just like running, get your foot on the ground, get it off, get your foot on the ground, get it off, engage power, let it go. And then let that follow through, let it slide out. So I always like to say, don't go out the back door. Cause then if you go out the back door, then the only way to get your arm out is to do this. So if you go out the side door, you can just swing it around. Nice and relaxed and natural. So reach big, pull short, quick in the back and long in the front. And the length of the glide in the front, 
is completely up to you. It's just kind of an off switch for your stroke. Let your muscles um, disengage before you re-engage them. It creates balance and stability for the breath on the opposite side. And uh, it allows some time for you to set up the catch because otherwise you kind of, you don't take a break out here. You're gonna take bubbles down and you're gonna go right into bending and that can cause some internal rotation. So yeah, so that's the biggest question. Now, that's the answer to the fix. The better question is, why do we emphasize the finish of the stroke? Does anybody know that? Well, I guess you would think you're, you think you're, st you're still getting a, some power out of it in the back. Oh, and there is power. Great point. There's a ton of power. It's, so we have to look at swimming a little bit differently. Because we're doing our sport in an environment that's 800 times more dense than air, there are a lot of compromises we make. So for instance, there's a lot of power in a pull with the push. The but is now that your hand is stuck at your thigh, you're going to slow down and decelerate because you're basically, you can't get your hand out quick enough because you've added that extra pull. And then that's going to cause a chain reaction of other events in your stroke. So say for instance, you finish your stroke back here and you go to take a breath, but your arm is way back here and you go to take a breath, what's this arm gonna do? Now it's gonna fall, okay? But you're taking a breath and this arm falls, then your shoulder falls, then your hip falls, you're about ready to flip over or hooli as we say <laughs> in Hawaiian. But no, that doesn't usually happen. I've only had it happen one time in my analyst pool. What happens is you send out your scissors to counterbalance your feet to scissor. And then people go, oh, you have a horrible kick, Janine. It's like, no, you know what it is? It's not your hip falling. It's not your shoulder falling. It's not the lead arm falling when you take a breath. It's the pull arm back here that started that reaction. So the length of the pull back there, while it provides power, it also sets you up to sabotage the better elements of your stroke. So that, that makes sense to you guys? It's like, you gotta kind of run, oh, right. It's like you've added one ingredient to the recipe that just completely just threw the whole thing off. And it doesn't matter if nine of those ingredients are great, that one ingredient just spoiled the whole dish. And so that's the big thing. But let me give you guys a little bit of history on this. Before we swam the way we're swimming right now, what type of pole did we do before? Yes. Yes, we did the yes, exactly. All right. So here we go with the S pull. Can you put your power? Okay, we're putting our hand in here. We're gonna slide it out. Can you put power here? No. Now, as you slide it in, can you put power here? No. All right, where was power defaulted? To your hand was in a straight line with an extended tricep push. So it is a byproduct of the S pull. Now, now that our hand is back here, the only way to get out of that is a high elbow recovery, which is hard on the shoulder, and we begin again. So basically what you do is you have coaches that are looking at this and saying, well, gosh, there's so much power. You don't want to waste that power. And it's like, no, you'd be surprised. It's like, who goes out and tells you to ride in your big gear the whole time on a bike? Even in hills and windy conditions. No, you put it yourself in the appropriate gear to keep the cadence and conserve your energy so you can keep going. And the crazy thing is, is I'm not saying it's a short stroke. What you're doing is you're going out the side door here, what you're taking away in the back, you're adding in a reach in the front so that you're, you're doing an overhand stroke where most of your stroke is done by the time you get here. And then the rest of it is follow through and out the side. So that's why I said reach big, but pull short. And when I see myself in the mirrors of my analyst pool underwater, it does, I can see myself letting go here but if you look at it from the side, it still looks like a normal pull. And that's another, that's another whole thing right there. What it looks like and what the athlete is doing is often two very different things. And it takes a practiced eye to see when there's a little too much or maybe a little, a little too little, you know? So like, you don't want to go short here and short here. You don't want to spin out. You just shift your power forward. You shift everything forward, same length of pull, just more forward.
And then the more forward you are with your stroke, the higher your hips ride and the closer your feet are to the surface and kicking is overrated. <laughs> Great S poll. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Anybody right, Helen, did that answer that question? Yes, absolutely. Um, I wanted to chime in and ask anybody, um, Megan, Diane, Jackie, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I have one. So Ian, do you get no any questions. power from the, from the rotation of your body? Oh, okay. So I, was, I started a run challenge the other day and I was thinking, okay, are you talking hip and core rotation or shoulder rotation? Shoulder. Move. Okay. Who thinks, what do we think about a runner doing this? <laughs> okay, guys, this is the widest part of your body, right? You want to keep this relatively still. I call that a rock instead of a roll. Now, now Total Immersion and Terry Laughlin brought a lot of people into swimming and, and you know, he really was quite a pioneer in bringing a mainstream kind of style of swimming worldwide. The issue with the total immersion is you go, you're going after one thing, which is trying to make yourself skinnier, right? And um, everybody know what t total immersion is? All right, mm -hmm. so um, let's take a look at um, some things in the aquatic environment and see if this is actually what we wanna do. Do we really wanna make ourselves skinny? It, it makes sense to have less drag, but then you're very tippy. So let's take the example of uh, a submarine. Is it skinny in the front? No, it's fat in the front and it's skinny in the back. Super tankers, they have bulbs on the front, ocean going super tankers to make themselves bigger in the front and then they're more tapered in the back. And we need to emulate that model rather than if we're skinny in the front, you know what's gonna happen? We're get, our legs are gonna spread apart in the back and that creates a much bigger drag and a much more energy drain. So shoulder rotation, what you wanna do is your shoulders just really should come along for the ride. They're not, they really, cause think about, um, do you ski? No. Okay, Anybody, any skiers in here? Okay, what happens to Hillary when you catch an edge? When you catch an edge, you fall. Okay, <laughs> your shoulders are your skis. Every time you drop that down, you're catching an edge and you're falling after it. And then there's going to be a consequence to that. So you really want to think about it just like in running. You want your chest moving forward and swimming. I'm not saying totally flat. It's like, just let your shoulders gently rock instead of rolling. So the next time you swim, try that. Try swimming very smooth. Just think about the arms paddling the surfboard, not the whole body. Um, and then throw some roll in there. And it might feel like you're working harder, which you are, because you're basically losing your balance. Um, and then the other one will feel maybe a little bit more mechanical, just try and be relaxed. So I think everything that we do in the water has to be actually very small, because the more we do, the more the water's gonna respond. And the more the water responds, usually the more work we're gonna have to do. So let's minimize that to begin with, you know? Um, there's an interesting analogy I have as far as bikes and bike fitting and bike frames. Um, obviously, when you're on the bike, you're pretty tall up, right? We could theoretically have bikes that are much lower to the ground and would have a lot less resistance. But your bike and your fit is based on power, access to power. And that's the same thing with swimming. We don't worry about front resistance. We try and keep our balance and have access to power. That makes sense. Yeah, there we go. Well, so shoulder rotation. The, the question is, the answer is just keep. It's a rock, not a roll. You can remember that one. Anybody else? Sinking legs. L sinking legs. All right. First of all, not everybody's going to be a great kicker. Second of all. A lot of energy spent on the legs is going to be pretty, a lot of energy drained because it's the largest muscle group in your body. So how do we get those legs up? Um, if we're not, you know, I'm gonna back up in my little room here. Ideally, what we're trying to do is, and Terry had the right idea with kind of this front quadrant swimming, which means that you wanna put more of your 
power in the front. But I think quadrant, which would imply quarter, is a little too short. So I like to break the body down into three segments, from fingertips to shoulders, from shoulders to hips, and then hips to legs. If all of my power, think front wheel drive, is in the front here, it's gonna create lift in my legs and your legs become lighter and your kick becomes more propulsive if you should choose to do it. But you can also just go back to a simple 2B kick. And then Brad, the other thing is, is I get people that have a limiting belief that feel like they, um, they are, I'm a sinker, that you identify as a sinker. You know, it's not about body weight. It's not about body fat. It's about belief and tension. So if you can do like Janine was saying, the float face down, relax, find your balance, kick your legs just a little bit and let, realize, man, the water will support me if I don't struggle. So when you surrender and let the water do her job, you win. When you struggle, you'll sink and you lose. So those are the two things. Work on a relaxed body position. And also, if you're finishing your stroke thumb to thigh, it's going to create an anchor and a rudder, by the way, a rudder, which can pull you off course. Any other advice uh, regarding kicking, like how often you should kick if it's once every stroke or, you know, any kind of advice? That's a, you know, it's really funny because I hear a lot of people. Um, well, first of all, what, what, what have coaches told you as far as your kick and um, what kind of advice have you been given? Uh, not much yet, but I know that's what exhausts me. That's where I get most out of breath. So my biggest issue is breathlessness and you know been, I, I Barbara coaches me and so we've been working on, on breathing uh properly yeah and, um but yeah but I think I I watched some YouTube videos that suggested that beginners over kick um so I've been trying to lessen how much I kick to be able to breathe longer oh that is perfect okay and that's exactly it so the legs are a panic button the legs are coming in as a response reaction to um, the brain being a little bit panicky. And so, you know, so the breathing and, and the kicking go together. I would say, don't even worry about kicking. You create better, a better pull. Like, and I actually like to recommend people that over kick. I want you to swim a length without a pull buoy and don't kick at all. And that's going to force your power and your pull to get better. Like, and I really think that kicking is really like, you know, tapping your head and rubbing your stomach. You're trying to think the feet are fast, the arms are slow. This is that going on. Just let the legs do whatever they want to do, but do it where you don't even kick at all and really find your power and your pull in your upper body, which is a heck of a lot better muscle groups for you to use. And, and then just let your legs just kind of just do a little kick. That's all you need. Love it. Yeah. And you know what? I still like kicking, like kicking with a kickboard or kicking with fins just because it gives a variety. And it's also great. Uh, like kicking by itself is great for recovery for your legs for running and cycling. First of all, you're in water, so you're in hydrostatic pressure. Um, you're giving them kind of a mini massage. But, you know, like Barb wears the blue fins. I wear the blue fins every workout for something. And I wear my fins every time I swim in the ocean. I can, I can keep up with the dolphins that way. <laughs> yes. Can I, can I ask a question about uh, kick drills? Um, I'm one of those people that if I kick, um, I basically go nowhere or I can actually go backwards. Perfect. So, but my, my coach gives me kick drills. So I put, the only way I could go forward is I put fins on. Fins on. And then I can go forward. So should I tell her no kick drills or just... <laughs> Use the fins. Use the fins, but how's your frog kick? Uh, as in breath stroke? Yeah. It's awesome from what I've been See? told. Okay, so anatomically, we are either predisposed to a flutter kick, which means that you have flexible ankles and maybe a little bit pigeon-toed feet, or you're a breaststroker and you stand like a duck automatically and you have a thicker instep or and or inflexible ankles embrace the breaststroke in you besides breaststroke kick um is a fantastic kick for triathletes because it's the only 
kick that takes your legs off the sagittal plane. So everything else is in this motion and breaststroke is off the sagittal plane. Um, abductor, exercise and strengthening, hip flexor. So do some breaststroke kick. It's great recovery for cycling and running. Absolutely best. So yeah, embrace what you're good at and forget about what you suck at. And if you want to throw the fins on and do them with the drills, that's fine. But realistically, you're never going to be a good flutter kicker. But there's a lot of people in this world that can't do breaststroke kick to save their life. Embrace what you're good at and forget okay. the rest. Yeah. Good. Okay, and you know, you're not going to use a breaststroke kick in a, in a triathlon per se, but if it just gives you variety for training, I think that the benefits of the breast, a frog kick are fantastic. I mean, it's really, really good for IT band, hip flexors, psoas, abductors. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a wonder drug kick. Boom. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that, cause I, I tell people it's all about the pull and not to worry about the kick as long as it's driving the hip rotation. Yeah. And I'm glad to hear that that's true. Yeah, it's, it is true. Um, and I think, I don't know about driving because if you're driving, that means the hips are, really the center of power. <clears throat> yeah. I like to think that the hips kind of go along for the ride. Okay. If you are reaching far enough out, you get automatic, and this will address the hip and core rotation versus the shoulder. As you reach out, and this guy's not sticking back here, you're gonna actually get on your side. So, <laughs> so hip and ro core rotation, is more like a lean, a stretch, and that's a result of yeah. the reach. But this will all fall apart if you're letting this paddle hang back out here and then you're gonna lose your balance. Okay. So um, what you'll notice is that you're, as you reach forward, the corresponding hip automatically will tip down towards the floor, mm -hmm. ground or bottom, and then re it repeats. But it's not per se driven from the yeah. hips. That's like okay. a runner throwing their hips forward, thinking that's going to make their legs go faster. Doesn't work. Okay, poor yeah. choice of words. No, but but it but it, it <laughs> brought up a great point, and I appreciate that because okay. I it there's a lot of really confusing stuff out there that people can get hung up on. You're supposed to roll your shoulders. You're supposed to snap your hips, and I'm kind of like paddle your body like a surfboard, reach big, pull short. You're good. <laughs> It feels easy. It's not complicated. You feel successful. That's what the good swimmers are doing. Getting the least amount or doing the least amount and getting the most out of it. And uh, another thing that Hillary wanted to talk about was um, something that you want to run your mind through when you're working with your stroke. When you don't feel like you're doing anything, you're probably at your most productive. The less you feel in the water, the better you're swimming. Mm -hmm. The more you feel, the less efficient you're swimming because the water's coming at you and the, the more, it's like tailwind, right? You don't feel anything on a tailwind. So, but most people like to feel a headwind when they swim because they feel like they're productive. So the less you feel, the better you're swimming. I mean, let's look, look at Barbara. She's got skinny little arms and she, 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 she's this little metronome, right? In the water moves really quickly. It's what you're not doing more so than what you're doing. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? We've got 10 minutes left. Yeah, just to, to stay on the different strokes, do you recommend incorporating like a set of mixed strokes as a regular part of practice or? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm going to share a personal experience story. Uh, a friend of mine, Gorda Byrne, has these like swim, bike, run challenges. And one was, I don't know, I think I swam 50 days straight, mostly freestyle. And when I got done with that swimming every day, at least 2K a day, mostly freestyle, mostly with fans, I got in the pool. I thought I was going to be so fit. Oh my gosh. Not only could I not turn, my core was weak. The other stroke felt awkward and my freestyle went backwards. So you need to give your body a break from all of the, the stress of freestyle, which is very forward, very rounded, right? And there's already stress in life where we're, you know, washing <laughs> dishes on the computer, everything's forward. So backstroke, just take the hand, bring it out wide, slap the back of your hand on backstroke. You don't need to slice your hand all the way deep and down. Just throw this thing down. Bend your elbow to the bottom, press and get out. Wear fins. 
Um, breaststroke, if you like to do breaststroke, great, as I was mentioning, um, great uh, stretch for your other muscles. And I think that learning how to do butterfly, yes, 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 is great because it's like doing pull-ups in the middle of workout. Only You only have to do a 25, Brad, a 25. Hey, I do a butterfly called Scooterfly. I renamed it Scooterfly. No kick. Just pull your body and let your legs just kind of go. Yeah. So, yeah. So absolutely mix it up because freestyle gets to be so old and your body needs a break from those using those muscles so much. And it's also kind of interesting. I wouldn't say go huge sets, but um, you can also mix things up. You could go freestyle down, backstroke back. You know, you could go half a length fly. You could go, oh, Dave Scott loves breaststroke freestyle combination because once again, you're going to be working on the high elbow catch for your breaststroke. So absolutely mix in strokes. <laughs> yeah, to me. Can, can, can I ask you a question about uh, not mechanics, but uh, right now a lot of us are having a hard time even getting into a pool. Yeah. Um, either lanes aren't uh, available or when you get in there, the time is limited. What should we do? You know, I haven't been in the pool since October, I think, November. Yeah. Well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is even though you're not, if you're actively training in other things and you're keeping your cardio fitness good, um, you're going to be fine once you get back in the water. The bad news is the first week or so, the first workout, you're going to come home and you're going to take a nap because you're going to be so wiped out. And it's not from the swimming, it's from the walls. Because every time we're doing a flip turn or an open turn, we're doing a burpee. People don't realize that. And that's why during the summer months, when people gravitate to only swimming open water, they actually detrain. You'll actually notice your swim times get slower because you're not getting, whether if you do an open turn, you're grabbing the wall, you're doing a crunch, you're twisting and you're jumping and you're streamlining, you know? So, so you do a 2000 yard workout and you just did 80 burpees. Hmm. So that's why it's important, even in open water season to make sure that you get time in the pool. Um, you just keep doing what you can keep keep working on your upper body strength keep working on your flexibility keep working on the cardio and when you get back in the water there'll be a week where you're just like whoa this feels so weird but it'll come back i i've i really noticed that this year with covid we weren't able to swim in a pool and we swam in the ocean and we did it with no intensity and i got back in the water and within a couple of days i wasn't world record breaking fast but it, i hadn't like I, I guess the point I want to say is, I think we're fed this line that if we don't stay at this peak pin pinnacle physical level, that it goes away and it never comes back. It comes back. Your, your muscle remembers it. Your brain remembers it. And I think we all needed a, a little refresher break anyway. So we appreciate what we have anyway. So I think more people appreciate swimming now than they ever have because they can't. No. So next time, you, you know what I mean? It used to be, oh, I got to go to work out today. It's on my schedule. And now people are like, I get to swim because it's so good for your mental health to get in the water, you know? So I think it's, it's great. And all this ice swimming is crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I have like 45 minute sessions at my pool and I try to do short intervals and do a lot of fast uh 25s and 50s just because i feel like like you said swimming long and slow is you know it's i i think the fast stuff helps me more i i think you're absolutely right um it does more for your brain to kind of sprint and and get a little bit stressed out i mean i know that really the neuro pathways really start firing when you go really hard um, here's a great way to, um, I always suggest that you warm up though for at least 10 minutes of that time. And when I say warm up, you're at a perceived level, level of three to five. In other words, you're not breathless at all. Mm -hmm. A great way to really double whammy your sprinting and your cardiovascular is to push off the wall and go all out 10 strokes fast with no breath mm -hmm. and then some easy to the wall and then take about 10 or 15 seconds rest and then go try and go 12 strokes, no breath really fast. 
and then easy to the wall and then try and go 14 strokes really super fast, no breath, and then easy to the wall and then some another 25 and then repeat that. And the next time you go through it again, make sure, give yourself some rest. It's, you know, maybe you're getting equal rest, equal swimming. The next time you do the 10, you're going to go, 10 was easy. 12 was easy. 14 still a little bit harder, but you do that three times through and you will realize that you're really opening up your cardiovascular system. And, and that's what I recommend for people when they're doing an open water race and they only have a short amount of time in, in the water. Do you need to warm up your body or do you need to stretch open your lungs? Yeah. You need to get your lungs open. So sprinting with a bit with breath holding, those go really well together in just small doses. Okay, anybody else? Um, sure. How about some advice on turns? I don't think I've oh, done turns. It. You know, so um, a good open turn with a good streamline back to the burpee thing. Okay, coaches should be on you all the time. Streamline, streamline, streamline. I realize that there's no walls in an open water race, but the environment that you're training in is a pool and you can get so much benefit from getting into the stretch position because not people don't stretch enough. And if you go to the pool and you say swim 2K, you have an opportunity for 80 streamlined stretches. So that's, that's no extra time out of your day. So I would strongly recommend that. Uh, and the benefit to you would be is that you have you're getting an, a gulp of air on the wall and you should be able to streamline at least past the flags, just to the flags. And don't do it on the surface, go about a foot and a half underwater and, and then begin swimming. And your times will drop because it's you're going really fast, <laughs> but it's also really, really good for you. Explosive plyometric jump, stretching your shoulders, core, so as the whole lengthening the whole body. So um, Sheila Taramina is a really big fan of, of strength and, and core coming just from streamlining. So um, swim, find, do what good swimmers do. Yeah. I find myself when I'm pushing off the wall, get I get so low to the ground. I'm like, like. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a bit deep. To do that. I don't know. I'm like, I feel like I'm a fish, you know, like <laughs> then I come up. Yeah, yeah. May. So just try not to do the down. Just, <laughs> you just drop underwater. You're just having fun. Yeah. You're playing. You're playing with the fishies. I am. <laughs> yeah. But um, if I could summarize all of this, um, so everybody, first of all, thank you for coming, and thank you, Hillary, for having me. Swimming is not rocket science. Um, it's up to you to take the information that's available out there and try it and don't you, you can you can have something come from a very unusual source for instance something that really helped me understand the power phase of swimming came from reading about Usain Bolt and running in sport where in swimming they emphasize power 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 and long power Every other sport in the world is the briefest amount of power for the, or the most amount of power for the shortest amount of time. And when I looked at Usain Bolt, think about it. It's not about how much power he puts on the ground. It's how quickly he can get out of it. That's what makes him run that much faster than everybody else. So when you look at your power phase, and I'm not talking, so I'm suggesting you stretch, you catch, power, let go, power let go. But if you're going power, you're now going to be manipulating all the other elements of the stroke that move you forward. So next time you're on your bike, I want you to put the big gear on and ride the whole day. Next time you're running, I want you to put your whole foot on the ground and just see, <laughs> you know, and then think about that and go, yeah, it's not how much power you apply. It's how quickly you can get out of what you've applied. And then really just keep it simple. Go to the pool, take what example, whatever somebody has suggested, give it a fair try. If it makes you go faster and you feel like you're doing less, keep it. And if it doesn't, dump it. So yeah, yeah. ultimately you're the one, yeah. 
Thank you so much. And you had some very nice comments in the chat area. Oh, cool. To read it. Hey. I just took a clip of it and I'll send it to you. But thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Is, and is there any way, um, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or learn more about your swim program, if they make it to Hawaii? <laughs> uh, Carlinpipes.com. And uh, the book is available on Amazon, The Do-Over. It's a great story. It has a great ending, by the way, you know. <laughs> um, but um, I actually am going to be working with uh, Total Master Swimming in coming back. I'm, I'm going to be on the East Coast in April. And April 1st through like the 5th, uh, staying with Barb. And so Total Master Swimming has, hey, you guys, Omni, the Omni Pool. And where's that by? Anybody been there before? Yeah, yeah, it's the by, the NASA, uh, uh, by the uh, Coliseum. Exactly. Yeah. They have a swimming program and it's a, it's a swimming club. Not a swimming club, it's a health club. Yeah. Anyway, so if you're looking for places, so we're going to be, and I know Total Master Swimming has hours booked there, but we're going to try and do a workshop there. So um, I'll send the information once we, we get it kind of finalized. And so that would be right around Easter-ish and, and maybe, and she's swimming this, the dog. <laughs> yeah, so nothing beats. So carlinpipes.com, if you guys ever make it out to Hawaii, believe it or not, Alaska Airlines flies here from where you are. So uh jfk to seattle seattle to kona and uh yeah so if you're ready to fly once, once there, we get through covid we're all going out your way <laughs> i know and then the swim camp the swim camps are amazing it's a seven day camp sometimes they're five days and uh, we just go out and swim some the most beautiful water we have whales right now so you can see them breaching the dolphins are at the pier every day it's crazy and yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just a phenomenal experience. And the neat thing about the camps is, is uh, it includes two lessons in the endless pool with video analysis. So you're not just swimming in the ocean water. We're actually working with you on your technique throughout the whole week while we're enjoying these beautiful locations. So yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, great. Well, send me information on that too. I'll yeah. send it out to the group. And um, thank you very much, Carlin. We appreciate your time today. Okay. Thanks. Does everybody want to go swim right now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Lo one last final thing. You don't need expert video analysis. What you need is to take your phone to the pool and have somebody, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to swim on the black line from about 10 meters out. That's as far as you need to be, just a little bit past the flags. Have the person filming you put it in slow mo, right? And swim straight towards the camera and watch. What you're looking for is action, reaction. Watch where your hand enters. Where does it go? What do your hips do? What do your feet do? And that, that's what you want to do is you want to clean that up, up, entering slightly wider than shoulder width. And you guys, if you Google my name, there's tons and tons of YouTube videos, in, including a five-part series by Vasa that breaks down the whole stroke. Um, so, so yeah, just try that and then compare the other ways, right? Swim wide, swim narrow. Go back to wider. This is too wide, by the way. You don't want to go outside your center line. The widest part is here. But watch yourself. And then another video that's really interesting to see is do the same thing, but not in slow-mo, swimming away. Because your feet will tell the story of what's going on in your pole. Thank you. Great, pretty simple. This is wonderful. Thank you so great. much. Thank really you, guys. Have a great day. I'm going to go swim in the ocean. Don't hate me. <laughs> oh, we're jealous. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Awesome. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.